Welcome to our MOOC on quantum cryptography. My name is Stefanie Wehner. And my name is Thomas Wiedig. And during the following weeks, we will investigate quantum crypto together. So quantum cryptography exploits quantum effects in order to achieve secure communication. One of these effects, for example, is quantum entanglement. So if you don't know what quantum entanglement is, don't worry, we'll teach you during the course. We will assume, though, that you have some basic familiarity with quantum information. For instance, we'll assume that you know what a qubit is. So if you don't yet know what a qubit is, don't worry either. We've prepared some preliminary introductory videos and also additional resources that you can take a look at. In that case, pause this video now, take a look at the preliminary material, and then when you feel ready, come and join us again. So let's get started. What is quantum cryptography? The goal of quantum cryptography is to use quantum communication to achieve information security. Possibly the most famous application of quantum cryptography is quantum key distribution, or short, QKD. To explain QKD, let me introduce our protagonists, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob want to communicate. Possibly Alice wants to send Bob pictures from a party last night, or maybe she wants to send him the blueprints of a revolutionary new machine. Or maybe Bob is a bank and Alice needs to send him her financial details. As you might imagine, Alice and Bob are worried that someone wants to listen in to their communication. If you send information over a wire or through the air, anyone can in principle read the messages. In particular, we are worried about an eavesdropper, let's call her Eve or Evan, that may want to intercept our communication. Eve is a formidable adversary. Her entire mind is bent on only one thing, namely to read the secret messages communicated by Alice and Bob. So how can we prevent Eve from listening in? How can Alice and Bob communicate while protecting their secrets? Cryptography provides a general technique called encryption to achieve this. You can think of encryption as a safe. Alice has this safe. She can write down her secret message, put it inside the safe, and then lock the safe using a certain key. She then sends over the safe to Bob, and if Bob has a copy of the same key that Alice used, he can open the safe and recover the message. But as long as no eavesdropper, no Eve or even, has access to the same key, they can't open the safe. And so Alice's message remains perfectly secure. So this key is very important to their security. How much key do we need to protect our messages? It turns out that Shannon has already shown a long time ago that in order to achieve absolute security, the key needs to be just as long as the message. So that's a huge amount of key. If I send a one megabyte picture to Bob, we need to share one megabyte of key. And in fact, we can never use this key again for anything else. So there's a chicken and egg problem here. We want to exchange a secret, the message, but we need to start with the secret to begin with, the key that is just as long as the message. To work around this, Practical systems use a key that is much shorter than the length of the messages. But there's a flip side to this gain of efficiency, is that in order uh, to guarantee security, you need to put computational assumptions on the power of the adversary. And then the question becomes, how much willing are you to think that your adversary is computationally bounded? For instance, many of the crypto systems that are used in practice today can be broken as soon as someone builds a quantum computer. And you might think, well, we don't have quantum computers yet, so for the time being, I'm safe. But even that is not a good response, because anyone could very easily intercept all of the encrypted messages that are being exchanged these days over the internet, store them in their bank, in their basement, and then the day a quantum computer is built, bam, all these dirty secrets from the past become completely public. So to avoid using short keys, we thus need to find a way for Alice and Bob 
to produce more and more qi as they go along. Making qi is very tricky, unless, of course, Alice can whisper directly into Bob's ear as we could do here. It is very easy for Alice to produce a key in her impenetrable lab that no one else knows. But that's pretty useless because, of course, Bob also then doesn't know the key, which is something that we want. It's also easy for Alice to make sure that Bob knows the key by just sending it to Bob. But then an eavesdropper can intercept and will also learn the key and we're not secure. The challenge thus arises by combining these two demands. The need for secrecy, Eve shouldn't know the key, with a demand for correctness, Alice and Bob have exactly the same key. So can we create a key using classical communication? Well, it turns out that the answer is no. This is impossible. Because see, the problem is, whatever Alice sends to Bob, Eve, the eavesdropper who's listening in, can keep a copy of. So if Bob is able to get Alice's key from what he receives, then also the eavesdropper can get Alice's key from what she listened in on. So we have a symmetry breaking problem. So this is exactly what quantum communication will allow us to do, break the symmetry. One of the fundamental properties of quantum bits that we'll use is that quantum information cannot be copied. So if Alice uses quantum communication in order to talk to Bob, the eavesdropper can no longer copy that information. It turns out that we can exploit these ideas to design protocols that allow Alice and Bob to produce key. These are called quantum key distribution protocols and we'll teach you a few of them in this class. Quantum key distribution is in theory secure against an all-powerful eavesdropper, Eve. Eve can have an arbitrarily large quantum computer. She can solve any computational problem instantaneously. In fact, think of Eve as having control over all of the rest of the universe, except the lab of Alice and Bob. And she devotes all of these efforts to read their messages. So proposals for quantum key distribution are much older than you think. In fact, the whole field of quantum cryptography got started in the 70s, when Steven Wiesner first had the idea that quantum effects could be exploited in order to achieve cryptographic tasks. So the first actual protocol for quantum key distribution was proposed by Bennett and Brassard in 1984. And it's now called the BB84 QKD protocol. It's one of the things that we'll teach you about later on in the course. We will also teach you about E91, a scheme based on quantum entanglement proposed by Arthur Eckert. The perspective of quantum entanglement proved crucial to the understanding of QKD and it forms the basis of essentially all security proofs that we know today. So the cool thing about quantum entanglement is that it is inherently private by the laws of nature. If Alice and Bob have two qubits that are maximally entangled, then nothing else in the universe, in particular no eavesdropper, can have any share of that entanglement. If Alice and Bob thus go and measure this entanglement, they're correlated to get exactly the same bits, but no one else in the universe can know them. So we can produce a key. So that's a simple idea, at least simple in principle, on how to exchange a key. Alice would prepare a maximally entangled state in her lab, and she sends half of that state over to Bob. Now they can repeat this many, many times. The eavesdropper Eve, of course, can intercept any of the qubits that she wants. But then what Alice and Bob would do is that they'd look at some of the states that they've exchanged and perform a simple test on these states that guarantees to them that the states are still maximally entangled. And as long as they have this guarantee, they know that they're perfectly safe. They can then measure their shares of the maximally entangled states and obtain the same perfectly secure key. Alice and Bob can check whether they're maximally entangled using a bell test. We recently performed the first loophole-free bell test at QTEC in Delft, and we'll have a special video that will tell you more about this experiment later in this class. Amazingly, by performing a bell test, Alice and Bob can be secure, even if they do not know exactly what's going on inside their quantum device. For example, because they ordered the quantum device online and didn't build it themselves. 
This idea is called device independence, and we'll tell you more about it later in this class. So that's one of the exciting things about QKD, is that at least on short distances, it can already be implemented. In fact, it's even commercially available. And I think one of the first assignments for you in this course should be to Google QKD right now on the internet and try to figure out what's the best deal for a QKD system that you can get. Later on in the course, we'll have another guest lecture by Nicolas Gisin from Idée Quantique, which is one of the startups that manufacture QKD systems. Of course, experimentally, QKD is quite challenging to implement because all kinds of errors can come into the protocol. The equipment that is being used is never going to be perfect. And we'll teach you about some of these issues later on in the course. Possibly the most challenging undertaking today is to do quantum communication over very long distances. So the fact that we cannot copy qubits, quantum bits, is great for quantum cryptography. Eve cannot make a copy. But it also makes it more challenging to send qubits over long distances because we cannot amplify signals in the same way that we can do classically. Researchers are working on building a quantum internet and at QTech I'm working together with my experimental colleagues to develop a large-scale quantum internet. Within five years, we are hoping to have a demonstrator network in the Netherlands. In the future, a quantum internet would allow quantum communication between any two points on Earth. So key distribution is really one of the fundamental building blocks of cryptography. But using quantum communication, we can achieve much more. And we'll tell you about other tasks later on in the course. For example, you'll learn how to exchange a quantum secret or how to delegate a quantum computation securely to a quantum server, one of these uh, first large quantum computers that will undoubtedly uh, very soon be built. Our goal is to teach you all the basic tricks of the trade that you need in order to design and analyze quantum cryptographic protocols. We hope that when you're done with this class, you're well prepared to join us in our quest to develop quantum cryptography on a global quantum internet.